Hey everyone and welcome back to today's Bible study. We are in the book of 1 Peter and we're on chapter 3 today. So chapter 2 was reminding us that we are God's chosen people. We are born again and like babies we need milk all throughout the day which is the word of God. We always need to be consuming it. We are also called the lively stones and each of us makes up the body of Christ, the spiritual house, the church with Jesus as our chief cornerstone that we are all built around and who we rely on for our stability. We are a chosen generation. We are to be strangers in this world. This place is not our home and we are to be set apart, respect the laws and always shine the light of Christ. And when we go through suffering, we are to remember how Jesus went through suffering. Even though he didn't deserve it, he didn't sin, he took on our sin and he remained patient, kind, had integrity right until the end. And we are to do the same. And we were like lost sheep. And we're, now we found our way back to the shepherd. And we need his guidance every day. And so we are on chapter three now. So let's get right into it. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversion of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear so wives are su to submit to husbands and this is not out of fear or control or anything like that it's a voluntary thing we are to choose to be this way and it's not because one is better than the other we are both equal in god's eyes and it's nothing to do with being passive and being walked all over and taken advantage of at all it's about being in alignment with the order that God has placed on us on this earth. We are to trust and be led with confidence knowing that we are being led the right way and cared for and protected. And just as a man's responsibility is to lead, a wife's responsibility is to support that leadership. But of course, as, as we saw in the previous chapter with the way of the Lord, if a woman is being led away from the Lord's will, you're never obligated to compromise that commitment to the Lord. And it goes to show the power of the wife here. So they say, if the man is not being led by the word, the conversation of the wives can guide him into the correct way. And the way that you live your life can help inspire someone else. The same within relationships as well. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So we are to focus on the inward spirituality rather than the outward physical. Obviously there's nothing wrong with doing your hair nice and wearing jewellery and wearing nice clothing but that shouldn't be all that you've got. We should be focusing inside first. Our beauty should come from the heart and one of my favourite quotes is a, is a meek and quiet spirit. I think it's so important to always try and embody a gentle and quiet spirit as a woman. For after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So we're told here to look at the women from old time, the holy women from the past, and who their models were. They put their hope in God. They adorned themselves by submitting to their husbands. Mm, commentary is good here. It says, a wife's holiness before God is tied to her respect for her husband. And we're given an example here of Sarah who used her words to build Abraham up rather than tear him down, even though he didn't often lead correctly. Do what is good and don't be afraid, basically. Should we highlight that? Yes, we shall. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together in the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So the Bible's saying that husbands are also to spend time with their wives, listen to them, know what their needs are, protect them because they are the weaker vessel. Obviously, physically, we are weaker and we need that protection and that care. 
and we are to be co-heirs of the grace of life. That's so beautiful, it shows that equality. Heirs together, one is not better than the other. We are both given our own strengths and we work together to make that a beautiful partnership. And you know, the, the Bible doesn't, doesn't sugarcoat anything. Instructions to the husband are, are very clear here that a husband who is refusing to align himself under God's agenda and contribute to his wife can't expect his own prayers to be answered. Yishk. So yeah, um, our roles are really important and the way we behave is crucial. So yeah, the, uh, the old Marvel superhero things have taken a very powerful concept from the Bible, which is with great power comes great responsibility. And this is very true in this case. Okay, let's keep going. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion of one another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Oh, I like that. And I like that he says to be of one mind. We are all one body of Christ. We should really all have one goal, which is to advance the Lord's kingdom and to glorify Jesus in everything that we say and do. And we're meant to love one another. And that doesn't always happen. There's a lot of division within the church itself. And regardless of what our views are on denominations, if everyone loves Jesus and recognizes him as Lord, like that's really what matters. And so we should be loving one another and having compassion and not be causing discord and division and fighting. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips th that they speak no guile. So we are not to give evil for evil. We are not to slap back with smarky remarks or do evil acts when someone does something evil to us so that we can inherit a blessing. We are given rewards in heaven for the actions that we do on earth. And in order to, in order to access these blessings in heaven, we have to put ourselves under his authority. That means taming our tongues. We need to turn away from evil things, do what is good and pursue what is peaceful. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Ooh, that one hurts, but it's true. <laughs> so it's encouraging to know that his eyes are over us and his ears are open to our prayers when we are righteous and we are behaving in a way that glorifies God. But when people do evil, he turns his face away. And we don't want that. We want his face to shine upon us. So when people say, oh, what do you mean? You can be saved and then still do evil. It's like, no, he, he turns his face away from you. You're going to struggle a lot in this life. And if you're really saved, you will want to do the will of the Father and not do evil because he hates evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. I love this. But even if you suffer for doing what's right, you are blessed. And when anyone asks you, like, how have you got such hope in this awful situation that you're in? This is where we are, to, we are told, be a witness for Jesus. So when they say, how are you so calm right now? How are you having such hope? How are you not screaming and getting really angry? And you say, because of Jesus. And that's a great testimony. You see people go through such horrific things, yet they have a peace that you know you can't get from anywhere else but Christ. Of course, that doesn't mean that you won't hurt and you won't be sad, but there'll be a peace there that you know Jesus is with you. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. 
For Christ also hath one suffered for his sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So we know everyone's going to suffer. There is no way of getting through this life without some kind of suffering, but it is better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. We know we have rewards in heaven for doing good and for suffering for doing good, and the consequences of evil is death. So we don't want to go down that road. And again, he reminds us that Christ is our perfect example of godly suffering. He suffered for sins, not his own, ours, so that we could have a way to God. By which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So Jesus actually went to hell in the spiritual realm and he proclaimed his victory. which some time were disobedient, then once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So Jesus went down into hell, proclaimed power over Satan and his little minions, and then he was raised from the dead, put on the right hand of God. So our present suffering doesn't compare to the victory that we have. And Jesus spoke through Noah, offering salvation to humanity as he built the ark, but sadly only eight people, Noah and his family, responded. And our ark is Jesus. How many are leaning on Christ? for their salvation, how many are getting on the boat. So there we go, that was chapter three. Another great chapter, so many good things in First Peter. I really do love this book. So let's quickly reflect on what we've learned today. So we know the structural order for relationships on earth is Jesus, man, woman. We are told as women to voluntarily submit. Now, not in a way that's under fear or coercion or dominance or anything like that it's just allow yourself to be led we do have different roles to play because we have different gifts and our nature is different we are told as women to focus on our heart and our internal beauty more than our outside beauty that is no point being beautiful outside and having an ugly heart the lord sees your heart we'd be gentle and quiet not as in not talking, not as in your opinions don't matter, just gentle, quiet, speak with purpose, don't just ma -ma 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 -ma. <laughs> you know, gentle and quiet, that's what that means. And we are to look to women of the past as an example for us. And even Sarah, who obeyed Abraham, even though he didn't always lead wisely, and men and women are to be co-heirs together. And there is a big consequence for men who do not lead correctly because then their prayers might not be heard so they have a big responsibility to love and protect and honor and care and guide us as well we're to be of one mind with all our family in christ and love one another and our rewards are in heaven for doing good things on earth we are not to return evil with evil because the lord hates that he wants his eyes and his face and his ears are open to us who are righteous and make good holy decisions and then he turns his face away from those who do evil we are rewarded for suffering for doing good and again we look to jesus as an example of that perfect suffering and be a witness for him whenever we're going through hard times and people ask you how are you doing this and tell him about jesus and then it's the peace of christ jesus after he had conquered death he went down to hell and proclaimed victory over Satan and then was raised again and he is our ark so the Old Testament didn't have Jesus then they had the promise of Christ but he hadn't come and paid for their sins at that point but he is our ark our modern day ark how many people are going to get on the ark how many people are going to put their trust in Jesus to be saved baptism saves us not necessarily the water physically part but answering of a good conscience by the resurrection of Christ who is now in heaven and is on the right hand of God angels authorities and he has full power and control over everything he is king love it thank you 
Uh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so there we go. That is chapter three. We've got a few more chapters to go and then we are done with the book of First Peter. I hope you've enjoyed this today. I hope this has blessed you in some way. Please do leave any thoughts and takeaways you've got in the comments below. Remember, Jesus loves you. Good willing, I'll speak to you soon. And until then, have a blessed day. Bye. Likewise, ye hum, you hum, um, the hum, the, and we're saying, bat to bat, put it in the wrong place. This is why we use pencil people for everyone who tells me to use pen. I can't.